This is a new game. It's supposed to be an MMO. So let's take a look at it. Dune Awakening Direct. All right, here we go. So this came out today. I didn't watch it while it was live because I was busy uh, doing work. I know, I'm sorry. I have to spend one day a week working. All day. I, I can't stream until the, the evening. Okay. So that's the game. Dune Awakening. Hello and welcome to the very first Dune Awakening Direct, a brand new series where we'll be taking a look at all things Dune Awakening okay. from our studio here on Arrakis. <laughs> on this episode, we'll be chatting well, who's to in the other Vilas, chair? He's the chief creative officer they must be wearing camouflage. for Dune Awakening here at Funcom and he will tell us what players can look forward to this year and he will share some news about our beta testing phase. And then We'll also be taking a look at the brand new gameplay trailer that we're just so excited to share with you all. But first, we'll look at what it takes to bring the most dangerous planet in the universe to life. From book, to film, to video game. Let's get started with creating worlds. Arrakis is this unrelenting anvil against which people are beaten and shaped and forged into something that's stronger. There's something very spiritual about that sand, which on the surface is really nothing, but underneath has a really diverse biological backstory. Yeah, I had no idea, like, I remember I was talking to Will Neff about this, because I had never read any of the Dune books. Like, I had just seen, like, some of the movie, and that was about it. And, like, he was explaining some of, like, the themes in the books. And, like, for the first time in probably, like, 10 years, it actually made me want to read the books. Because I think that, like, sci-fi, like, the best type of sci-fi, a philosophical exploration into a theoretical future. And that's one thing that I really like about sci-fi. And I think the best types of, like, stories are that. And I feel like if I'm going to read any sci-fi book... It's gonna fucking be doing. Favorite lines from Frank Herbert is when you end a novel, it's like a train coming into the station that doesn't stop. Nope. You just jam on the brakes and let the sparks fly into people. What do y'all think about the gameplay and the graphics? I think it kind of sucks, but if the gameplay is good, it's fine. That's my opinion. Graphics aren't really anything to write home about. Arrakis is a test, is what the friends They're, they're say. fine. And the player comes right into the heart of that test. Dune Awakenings of survival game at the base level. And it begins. Dune Awakening is a survival game at the base level. Okay, that's good to know. Like a traditional survival game, you know? Like, you, you're looking for water, you're looking for shelter. Sure. You know, where will you find water in the desert? Will you, will you take it from others? So when we talk about survival, sure, we start with the basic kind of survival. Survive. And then when you've survived long enough, it's now time to think about political survival. Well, how does that work? Within the universe. I really am worried about this. Because I, I can think of one or two ways this could be absolutely fucking lit. And I can think of one or two hundred ways where it would be absolutely not. The approach we take when building you know? a world like Arrakis is, is we kind of have to think about where are the stark lines and how do we draw these epic spaces? How do uh -huh. we make them feel huge? And the player feels dwarfed by everything they see around them. The intention was every time. That's a really good point. I think that making like large scale like spaces, like obviously Shadow of the Colossus did a great job at this. I think New World had some places in the world that kind of had that large scale to them. And like games that do that in the right way, I think are amazing. Saw the desert, it was highly brutal. And if you went out into the desert, Elden Ring, yeah. The bright protection and without looking at the massive tree. Sure, death. If we looked at references from some of the hottest deserts in the world, the visuals that we saw from those deserts weren't enough. We needed this world to be even harsher. So we've been working with Legendary since the very beginning. They've been very generous with sharing with us assets from the film and allowing us to see things from the film and allowing us to really understand the, the vision that Denis Villeneuve has for the, the world and his characters and the way he's grounding Arrakis. Mm -hmm. But of course, a game is a much larger scale so we need to expand upon that vision. 
we have our own army of concept artists who are sending things back and forth with Legendary all the time. One of my best moments on this project so far, actually, was I got to go and visit the set of the first film with a group of the people from Funcom, the art director. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about with this, but I actually wish that they used the books more for reference than just the film. It kind of is unsettling to me, the fact that they're talking so much about making it derivative of the film. Not that the film's bad. Like, I'm not saying the film's bad. Who said they don't? Why did you? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Maybe they are, but they're talking about the film a lot for visuals only. Okay, cool. That's fine. Does the lead artist? Yeah, I think the visuals in the film are fucking insane. In the actual sets that they had built in classic old school set building, massive palaces, and yeah. we got to look at the ornithopters from the inside and the outside. Right, we got to walk around and get a sense zero of two with scale. flying. Well, I think what they had done really well is they'd been quite inspired by the world that we had built mm -hmm. in June part one. Now on a film you're sort of led on a journey by the director and by the script, whereas in a game you have the opportunity to sort of create your own narrative mm -hmm. and create your own journey. That looks the nice. The exciting aspect for me is that to sort of like, create your own. This definitely passes the vibe check. Are the graphics in this game as good as the graphics in other games? No, it's they're not. They're not that good. But this passes the vibe check and it's good enough narrative this is this is journey. fine the most exciting aspect for me is the fact that you can take what you've enjoyed and loved and you can build your own stories and your own places mm -hmm. and that to me is the ultimate goal is to have you know complete control using unreal 5 to create a game is obviously one of the better choices unreal 5 gives us flexibility through the blueprinting system it allows us to handle amazing graphics through the rendering system sure. lighting system such as lumen lumen technology allows proper light bouncing if i had to say one thing in the game that really benefits from lumen it's play there are a lot of games that look really good now because of unreal 5 unreal 5 has been a massive like i i, I bet as a small development studio it's a massive godsend like it must be incredible to where like this new tool allows you to create worlds in a scale in a scale that you could have never even imagined in the past. But I really don't give a fuck. I want to hear about the gameplay. How are the systems going to work? How's the game going to play? Because we're playing a game, not a. I mean, if we wanted to see a really great world, we would have just watched the movie. They are crafted spaces. In our case, it's like you build. The, like, think about how many Unreal Five games we've played that are like and so mediocre. And, light, and the light will fill the room. But they look the great. That feels yeah, this looks weird. amazing, right? And but like, okay, that now what? That technology hasn't existed before. Before Unreal great. Five, in the olden days, it's it's, it's astonishing. The LOD system, and that meant that you had to create assets at different LOD levels, so it doesn't slow down everybody's computer. With Unreal yeah. Five, we have this new technology called Nanite that breaks things down into the right amount of polygons at the right distance. So for us, yeah, as a company, this has made an amazing difference to the visual detail of the world. It allows us to create one really amazing looking cliff piece, for example, and then doesn't it's matter amazing. how far away or how close we place it, it performs well and it looks yes. great. Incredible. Where Unreal worked for us on June, the rocks look really was nice. A fantastic pre production and planning tool. On June part two, we had some very complicated scenes and we were able to pre vis all the way from Budapest what the light was going to be doing well in advance. It's the only tool that I've used, I, I would say, in my 25 years of shooting that is able to be used across a wide spectrum of films by f different types of filmmakers. The most iconic creature is the in sandworm. the universe is the sandworm of yeah. Arrakis. And so we've tried to represent this in the game in multiple ways. So as a player, your first steps on the open sand, you hear the hiss of the sand in the distance as a sandworm begins to move towards you. And when it gets close, you hear the roar as it erupts from the sand nearby. And at that point, you have only seconds to live if you cannot make it to rocky ground. So this is your first experience with sandworms. And these are the little ones. When you go into the deep desert, when you're harvesting spice, the giant ring mouth sandworms that we've seen in the film will erupt underneath the spice blows and suck harvesters and equipment down into the sand beneath them. Cool. There's really only one rule. The sandworm will always come. Humans have always had this innate drive to create something, to build worlds, whether it's in their head, whether it's in text, whether it's on screens, whether it's in games. 
Funcom as a company has been on this journey for a long time, creating multiplayer worlds where players can live out their dreams and fantasies. We were there in the beginning with massively multiplayer online games. We've been there in the beginning with survival open world. Yeah, this crafting. is supposed to be an MMO. That's what they said initially. Crafting games. And June is a combination of those legacies, bringing us forward into the future. It's the culmination of what Funcom means as a company and what we can deliver. And this legacy means that we need to really pay attention to what it's we're creating. It's fine. It's not and great. How we create it, it looks fine. Fans. Because I think at the heart of this, there's a lot of people out there who really want to live in the universe that Frank Herbert created. And they really want to live in the visual world of the films that they see from Villeneuve. And so we need to create the gap between those two possibility spaces and create a game world where people can live out their fantasies that they've taken from Dune. And yes, it's a huge legacy. The biggest fantasy that comes out of Dune in my perspective is like, yeah, of course, it's like the whole like waste wanderer of the future, etc. But it's also like being able to interact with like the other houses and like the different like uh, factions in Dune. And so like if you don't nail the social systems, like my idea of like what Dune is doesn't really happen. Yeah, it's very political series. Yeah, there's a lot of politics to it. So it's like, how do you create a game that like reinforces that type of behavior? And it's like the only game that I can think of that like really hits that is like Eve, Eve Online. I don't know. It feels at times extremely overwhelming, but we really hope that we can deliver something for everybody. Yeah. Wow, that was great. Creating captivating... In a general, like, in general way, I actually wish that they didn't go with the existing factions, like the Harkonnen and, and shit like that, and they allowed players to do their own thing and make their own factions themselves, rather than have people ally with, like, the existing factions in the game. And that way, it would feel more authentic. Maybe they will. Yeah, I would kind of like to see that more. ...visions on the big Personally. screen and the immersive world of games, of course, both certainly come with their own unique set of challenges. And I think it's very clear that both mediums draw deeply from the seminal book that started it all. Now, of course, Villeneuve's movies have mesmerized the audiences with their adaptation of Frank Herbert's masterpiece. Uh, it's been showcasing the intricate politics, the very stunning visuals, and the harsh desert of mm -hmm. Arrakis. And now, as we venture into the game, uh, the challenges of bringing this rich universe to life really takes on new forms. So here to share this exciting process with us is Joel Biles, the Chief Creative Officer for Dune Awakening. Joel, and that's what the chair to the was for. Show. Thank you very much for having me. It's exciting to be here. I am so excited that you're here because I get to pick your brain. I have so many questions and I want to dive straight into this. Uh, Dune Awakening is a survival MMO. Two words everyone watching will be familiar with. Sure. But what's your take on that? What, what is does a that mean? MMO? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so survival games are obviously a genre of, of games about like building yourself up from the bottom and surviving. Uh, MMOs are more about social interaction and, and you know how players work together to achieve big goals. And we thought okay. why not combine the two? You know, why don't we create a game? Because most of the survival games that are out there, they kind of you, you once you get to a certain point of survival, you, it kind of ends, and that's kind of where you've gotten to. Yeah. But what we thought was right. like, the universe of June is a perfect place with these politics and this intrigue and these machinations that happen. So let's get players hooked on the survival and then bring them into the political survival of the June universe. Let's break it down then and dive a little bit. I'll be honest. I actually think that sounds pretty good. Yeah, that actually sounds pretty good. Okay. Deeper, starting with the survival part. What are we surviving on Arrakis? What's out there? I mean, worms? Yeah? Players? Sandstorms. Like, theoretically. What else? Other players. Um, yeah, so the player. I mean, obviously, Arrakis is all about the heat and the water. So the player, first of all, needs to be searching for water. Um, they need to stay out of the sun, stay in black shade during the daytime, travel by Dramatic, night. I love that's, it. <laughs> that's what the, that's what the Fremen say, right? That's what the, yep. the Kitan Al Gaib says says it in the book, right? Black uh, black shade by day, travel by night. So the the player needs to th worry about these things, think about the sunlight, think about where they are, but they also need water because that runs out really quickly without a still suit and you die very fast. So yeah, there's lots of ways in which to get water. You can uh, explore dew fields and eat, you know, eat plant fiber to try and get water out of it. Okay. After a while, you start to throw up because you can't really get too much water out of plants. It's the way a lot of these games work. The more, you know, the way I prefer to do it is to shoot enemies, take their blood, drink that. 
What the fuck? just casually fuck? dropped that right there. Uh, okay, so, so we're we're harvesting okay. blood. Uh, okay, this this seems like good. Plants, uh, I'm I'm liking the sound of this. Stay hydrated, which is very important. This is sounding yeah, good. Stay hydrated at home, in and out of game. Uh, is, are there other resources I need to worry about? Uh huh. Yeah. So as a player, I mean, it's a it's a proper survival open world crafting game, right? So players will craft their entire arsenal, right? So they'll be they'll be collecting resources, you know. They'll be collecting stone, they'll be collecting metals like copper, iron, eventually forging steel, um, building up the equipment that they have at home. So they'll be crafting you know, all their weapons, all of their gear, all of their clothing, and they can, of course, craft themselves a base to live in, um, craft machines to help them craft bigger machines, which allow them to craft better weapons and so forth. All right, so there's a lot to do, is what I'm hearing. Uh, base building, you just mentioned, that's obviously very exciting. I saw you guys shared a sneak peek of what a base could look like uh, already on your TikTok channel. Very cozy. Why would I ever leave a home like that and like head out into the desert? Uh, but you I'm sure stuff. you guys give us plenty of reasons to do just that. Um, is there anything special about the base building in this game? Yeah, so we, we took what we started with in Conan Exiles, our other survival game. Uh, we brought that over, Okay. then we started to add to it, right? So we've now created a system for co-op building, where you, will, you can place out holograms and other players. I think so that's one of the big things that survival games need to have, is like group building of like large scale structures, because I just think it looks really cool. Like, I think that there's really something to be said for things that just look really fucking cool. That's it. In, so you work with your friends, that's build bases. It. You can also save your bases like an architectural blueprint. That you can then sell to other players on the exchange or you can That's give incredible. to your friends so they you know if you make something really cool one of the things we saw in conan exiles that i really liked day, was yeah. that players were building the taj mahal they were just building really cool buildings and it's like what if you sure, sell that to another player that'd be cool right so another player might want to be able to just buy that blueprint off you and then place that out in the world and build it themselves so we're really enabling the sharing and sort of the way the building system works allowing it to be very cooperative Okay. That's incredible. I, I absolutely love that. Uh, well, I know my story arc is going to be architect who harvests blood occasionally, but you know, you do what you got to do. Uh, now, now that I have my basic needs all met, you know, I'm staying hydrated uh, in some unkosher ways uh, and uh, I'm having my base. Uh, how do I protect myself and my base from the world? With a gun, like, you shoot them. What, what am I doing for combat here? So the Shall not be a, infringed. has a full leveling system, right? Yep. And, and we, we do this thing we call the arms, which is like, we have melee, we have ranged, and we have abilities, and we also have vehicles, right? So okay. players can use any combination of these in combat, right? So it's kind of That's creates interesting. This interesting dynamic. All so right. you can learn abilities from the great schools of the universe and learn how to be a Bene Gesserit, compelling your enemies to come close to you so that you can stab them with a knife. And you combine your, you know, so you're combining melee with abilities there, right? Or you can be a sword master and leap in with a knee charge, knocking people to the ground and then stabbing them. Or you cool. can choose to be like a trooper and you use your Shigawai reel to pull you up like a grappling hook, to pull you to high places where you can shoot down on your enemies with sniper rifles and shotguns. So there's a large variety of like weapons that you can craft through our intricate crafting system in addition to these abilities that you learn as you level up your character. So you kind of have this freedom of choice, and that's really what Combined Arms is all about. It's sandbox combat. That's what we're trying to call it and what we're going for, right? Uh, are those hard-locked in class? I think that's a, it's a good idea to do that. I mean, it also, like, this is something that lives and dies by its balance. And if it has good balance, it's good. And if it doesn't, it's bad. It's that simple. Or is there, like, a... Can I explore different skill trees? Like, yes. can I be a swordsman uh, or a swordsmaster and also use the voice? Is that possible? It's absolutely possible. You just have to find the right trainer in the world who'll teach you these things. So you, you look it up on the internet. Creation, you make a choice of who was your mentor when you were young, and then you choose one of the things, and that's your that determines your set of starting abilities. But then when you play the game, you find trainers in the world. You have to do things for them, but then they'll eventually teach you some of the way you know, the path that can take, okay. take down some of these skills and abilities, yeah. I love that. Okay, so uh, lots of things to ex uh, explore there as a player and, uh, and avenues to take, uh, all in order to protect myself um, and maybe my friends if, if I feel like it. What am I protecting? Like, how do I protect myself against sandworms? Like, can I fight them? You just can I get ride away. Them? Like, what's, what's the deal with them? Sandworms are, are, are like a tension mechanic in the game. We okay. want you to be really, really worried every time you walk on the sand. So you really need to think about what you're doing. So there is no way to kill or defeat sandworms. Oh, wow. No, the only thing I, you I can cannot. do... You just cannot. The only thing you can do is avoid the sandworms, right? So, <laughs> so you craft yourself a thumper and place it out to distract a sandworm. 
maybe you use it to lure sandworm onto some friends of yours or, or some <laughs> friends. Uh -huh. on how <laughs> As one does. And 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 uh, and the other, the other thing you can do, of course, is craft yourself a vehicle. Like we have a, a range of vehicles in the game, including the iconic ornithopters, and players will be able to craft these. And you'll be able to use these to, of course, traverse safely. Right? If you're in an ornithopter, you fly above. If you're on a sand bike or something like that, you can move quickly across the sand. Hopefully, a sand one won't get you if you time it right. Hopefully. Hopefully, you know. That's what we're hoping. I, I love yeah. a constant looming threat. Sounds really stressful. Sounds perfect, actually, for a survival <laughs> MMO. Uh, one thing that, like, this is going to be really important is, like, if this game has large servers. Because I, I feel like that's one of the things where, like, a lot of these newer MMOs just, like, kind of really miss the mark is that the server sizes are so small that you can't have ex an experience of scale. So, like, if it's 200 people in a server, like, what the fuck? That's not a game. Like, that's not an MMO. Like, what is this? Now, yeah. you already alluded to some of the cooperative things one can do in-game. Can we'll you see. elaborate a little bit more here or dive deeper into this? Like, sure. Can I, like, fully go on a journey with someone and then, like, do tasks with each other? Like, what can I do with other people? Yeah, so, I mean, hook up with your friends, join together with a grouping system. We have a ping system, so you can, you know, obviously point out things to players. Um, you, you will find different roles that you can assume based on the kind of combination of abilities you want to bring with you. And then you can heal your friends, of course, get them up when they get knocked down in combat, things like that. And then, of course, you go on journeys like there's, there's we have a system called the journey system. You can go on those journeys together and, and sort of explore the mystique of the universe. Um, through that, we also okay. have a contract system. When you go to trade posts, you'll, you'll be able to take contracts. It's a quest. Um, your friend and you can go out and explore and do these contracts yeah, together. Yeah, quest. We have small group play, we have guild play. It's all kind of what you'd expect to see in a social experience. Okay. What's, what's that sounds on, great. on the politics? Because obviously, the books and the movies, that's a big part of it. Like, the whole political intrigue. How predominant is that in the game? I mean, we, we want players to be able to dip into it. So you start the game kind of lost in the desert, right? And then by the end of the game, maybe you're the next Baron Harkonnen. So as you play through the game, you... And who you, doesn't want to be him? <laughs> <laughs> He's a good looking man. Oh yeah. Mm. <laughs> as, as you make your way through the, through the game, you, you progress and you, you sort of uh, meet these factions in the world, right? The Atreides and the Harkonnen are at war. There's a war of assassins going on, as it's called. And as a player, you decide which side you want to help, which side you want to join. Then you, you know, start to partake in, in missions for those factions. And eventually, yeah, you work your way up through the ranks of the factions and maybe you take on a position of power as well. So the politics okay. are, you know, they're, they're designed to actually encourage players to develop their own politics around the sandbox systems, right? So we have this Landsrad. The Landsrad will be demand that players do certain things. The factions need to work together or against each other to achieve these goals, right? So there's also this sandbox element to the politics. Which also then encourages like co-op play or uh, PvP play more. Co-op play or PvP play, yeah. Yeah, there's this, um, this kind of idea that, yeah, like when people have the same objective, but they're on opposite sides, it becomes a race between them to achieve that objective. Usually, yeah, that's true. Things to get to the top right. Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I opt out of politics? Can I just live my peaceful little Swiss life in my cottage? Absolutely. You can, you can play. Yeah, I think that's another really important factor, and I think that's the right answer, is that you shouldn't really force people. I think any time that you force people into a social system or something like that, you're probably just going to make them mad and, like, frustrate them. So I, I'm actually really glad that they're not making it, like, they're not making it mandatory. However you want. I mean, the idea is to be a sandbox and allow people to approach it how they like. Um, we have a mm -hmm. we have one of the rules of the, one of the pillars of the game is expression and customization, and that's not just about visuals. It's customizing how you want to play the game. So it's really thinking about like, well, I really like to craft and just set up my little crafting setup and yeah. sell things on the exchange to other players. So you can do that. You can basically live your life as a crafter. You can also be an architect, as we talked about. You know, you can be a pilot, a scout. You're not really heavily involved in the fighting, but you go out and you. You craft maps that you sell to other players as well. That's as interesting. Work. Okay. Uh, where are we currently at? Like, uh, I know there have been betas uh, already. How many more of those are coming? When is the next one? What's the status of development? Where are we at? So, yeah, we've been running betas now for several months. Um, they've been going really well. Uh, we're slowly inviting more people over time. 
So the game, yeah, I mean, we're not going to rush it out the door. We're going to work with our community and our players, and we're going to try and make the game as good as it possibly can be. It takes as long as it takes. Man. It takes as long as it takes, <laughs> and you've got to do it well. So, um, yeah, so we're working with our, our I community. I think that's the right decision, by the way. Like, it's a bad idea to release a game, and if it's, if it's fucked up, people are never going to forget it being fucked up. And, yeah, betas are continuing, right, all the way through launch, and we're going to keep increasing the number of people in those betas, helping a stress test yelling at us because they get eaten by sandworms, all those kind of good things. All, yeah. All the good stuff. Uh, speaking of good stuff, have there been any like recent milestones you're particularly excited about uh, or anything you want to share about the current development? Sure. There's a, there's, a, there's a thing as a creative director I like to say that we get a few aces. Every time we make a project, we get to make a few creative bets. Uh, there's a thing called the shifting sands, which is one of my most exciting... Uh, one of the things that makes me most excited about the game, and that is this location in the world, it's a full PvP area, and every week the Coriolis storm sweeps in and completely alters the landscape of this area. And I got to see that working for the first time very recently with, cool. with full yeah. landscape changing and people able to play, and it's, it's, it's exciting to see these things coming yeah, on. Yeah, okay. And I think it's something right. people haven't seen before in a game. So I'm excited to let 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 the audience in on it, you know. Isn't that just like a wipe and rust? I can't wait to be part of that audience, and I yeah. also can't wait to have more opportunities in the future to chat about the development and the process that you and the team are going through. Now, any last words? Anything you want to say to your future player base? Yes, uh, thank you everybody for joining us on this journey. I hope today's show was like your first taste of spice, mildly euphoric, slightly addictive, and leaving you wanting more. I certainly want more of yeah, that Yeah, just let now. me play the game. I'm pretty sure everyone watching as well, so remember yeah. for a chance to get an invitation to yeah. uh, any of the future closed beta tests, exactly. head on over to duneawakening.com and sign up for the beta. Then head on over to Steam okay. and wishlist the game. You can also join our Discord and follow our other socials at Dune Awakening. Also, of course, you can keep up to date on TikTok, Instagram and YouTube, where we will be showcasing regular sneak peeks into the world of Dune awakening now here is the moment that i'm pretty sure everyone oh has been okay this is the trailer all right let's see the trailer gameplay trailer for here we awakening. go actual gameplay capture using unreal 5.2 few survive it an angry boy. That looks nice. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Can you make that? That would be cool. Accurate Arachis PvP experience. Yeah, I like this. But the humans that do. Oh yeah, this this isn't what would happen in the actual game. Bro, I'd be looting everybody. Yeah. Dune open world survival MMO. Alright. Wow, Arrakis is truly the most dangerous I mean that looks not look good. I mean, but like, it's just that, like, I've seen a lot of trailers for games that look good. Like, I mean, yeah, that looks fine. But I mean, I, I, we need to play the game. We need we need to play the game. Like, come on, guys, we gotta play the game. Planet in the universe, and you know what? I can't wait to go there. Now, thank you all so much for watching. Stay tuned and join us on the next Dune Awakening Direct.
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell him, like, I mean, if any of the devs from this game, like, if you guys want to, if you guys want to stress test the game, give me fucking codes, and I'll stress test your game. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about a game like this, because it's just, like, it tries so many different ways. I talked it up so much just for that. Well, no, I mean, the trailer was fine. I mean, it's not like the trailer was bad, but it's just, like, I've, I've got to see the actual gameplay, man. I've got to see, like, the way that the, ex like, w what happens, like, you put in, like, 20 hours into the game. What is your experience? Like, that's what I need to know. That's what really matters. Because, like, a lot of these games, like, they, it's like these games, they survive on, like, hype. And they survive on, like, graphics or commercials or marketing or something like that. That's not the way you make a game. That's not the way that you, like, maintain a game. It's like Diablo 4, right? I mean, like, Diablo 4 was huge on release, and then everybody stopped playing it. So it's like, if you don't have that long-term experience, then there's no reason to even try. It shouldn't get boring after so many hours. Well, the reason why it won't get boring is if the social experience and social structures in the game are good. And there's long-term player progression. Like, that, that's the two ways for a long-term game, like, for a game like this to be entertaining in the long term. How much content can they, uh, can they fit into a desert biome? Sandworms are a vital point to the game, and it's so, like the desert can only do so much. So you're thinking that, like, basically, that it will be too one-dimensional? I think you bring up a very good point. I think that absolutely could happen. Now, would they add other worlds in the future after the, the desert planet? Like, yeah, maybe they might do that. I think that would probably be a smart idea. But we'll just have to see. Did you play Conan Exiles? No, I didn't. These guys made Conan Exiles, right? And so this is their next game. Yeah, I really just don't know. Warframe had perfect social elements. Yeah, I never played that game. I'm not sure. Conan can only have 70 players. Yeah, it's like, I'll tell you guys this. Like, I will 100% play this game. Like, it's a new MMO. Like, yeah, guys, I'm going to be playing it. Big fucking surprise, right? But the truth is, like, how much am I going to play this? Is it going to be fun to play in the long term? Like, a lot of that is going to be based off of, like, how many people can the server hold? What are the systems? Cap, cap it all you want, bro. I've been playing game. I've been playing new games a lot, man. Like, I'm going to be real. Like, I've been going in on new games. Like, y'all y'all are talking shit, but that's not even Dragon's Dogma 1. I am probably going to start playing that at the end of the week. That is my plan. I will let people know two days ahead of time. So you guys know when it's going to happen. But otherwise, uh, yeah, that's the plan. It's like I told you, the MMO has inspiration from the movie, the book, and the RTS video game, like WoW with Warcraft. Yeah, um, I just hope that the game isn't trying to capitalize on the movie's success and it's good in its own, in, in its own way. Right, that that's like that's one concern that I kind of have for for a game like this is that it's just trying to. It's like you know how like back in the day they would just make like games about movies and like you know they would kind of farm for a while, but they weren't really like that good at games in a lot of cases. That's kind of what I worry about with something like this. Do you not feel the whole sandbox elements kills the longevity of the game? That's why I never got into these survival type MMOs, knowing that I could lose my stuff at any point. I think that you can't have, like, really hardcore loss in a game if you want it to appeal to a mainstream audience. Because most people, like, get too demoralized. Like, I'm like this. If I feel like I make too much negative progress in a game, like, I lose too much in a game, I just, like, the reward, like, center of my brain is broken. And I'm like, okay, well, this isn't fun anymore. I don't want to play it. So... Tarkov would disagree. That game's massive. Yeah, I mean, maybe you're right. Like, I think that really they should do... They should try to make it the way that they think it should be. And then... Put it out to the player base and see how people respond. Like, that's what they should do. Like, go with your vision. Make the game the way you want it. But the problem with a lot of these things is, like, a lot of games... They get so fixated on trying to maintain the vision of the development team that they end up making the game worse in the process. And that's one thing that I would be worried about. You can solve that by adding non-gear-related power progression and then gear loss not being that big of a deal in terms of time and currency. Well, it depends on, like, what the reason is, right? 
Takes as long as it takes. Yes, right. Please take it. Yeah. This feels like an episode of Inside Star Citizen. <laughs> yeah. Selling building blueprints is actually a really great idea. Just think you could sell a really great building and then include a backdoor spot where you could later exploit. Yeah, I just don't really... I'm not sure if this kind of stuff would actually, like, work. Like, and this is kind of, like, the problem is, like, people talk about, like, these theoretical things. And this is a really big issue that I think a lot of gamers have is that people think about games in a way that is unrealistic. Because, like, would people really do that? No, I don't think people would do that. They'd probably just copy the blueprints on, on, a, on, on the internet. So it's like, whenever you have something and you know that everybody is just going to play it one way, you should try to make the game in that context rather than just pretend like it's not real or it's not happening. So, yeah, they idealize games. Yeah, exactly. Like... Oh, in an ideal situation, people would like, you know, sabotage each other by selling blueprints. But I think in the reality, people would just look up how to build a base. And also, why would you need to build a blueprint for a base? Like, what, like why would somebody need to do this in the first place? I, I, I can't even imagine that. The game will be over $80, just like Starfield. I don't think anything, like, I don't think anybody, like, if this game is as good as it could be, I don't think most people would have a problem paying $80 for it. But the problem is that I think people are concerned that it won't uh, it won't hit the mark, you know? I think that's really what the issue is. The game feels like uh, its scale is just going to be short of Arma and Conan Exiles was early access for a long while. So I don't doubt it would be good, but it seems idealistic. Yeah, like because whenever people talk about like these social structures and games, like I'm the kind of person that like whenever I play games, I usually try to break the games. And like make the games not work in the way that they're intended. And I think that a lot of people play games the way that I do. And I think also the way that I play games is usually a little bit ahead of the curve from the way that a lot of other people do, which is like things that I do at the beginning that other people will do later on, which is like different types of exploiting and like different weird shit like that, because it's usually the most efficient way to play the game. So a lot of times like game systems end up being like theoretically very good but players find a way like i think a really good example of that is like you remember that one like meme video where like that lady was like oh the square box you're the square peg goes in the square hole and then the guy kept putting everything in a square hole over and over and over like that's basically the best representation i can think of of how players interface with systems like this in games it'd be like that yeah that's basically what happens Making a game safe from that's probably the biggest hurdle. Yeah. Notice how they talked a lot more than they showed? Well, that's not a big deal all the time. Like, it, I, I mean, again, like, uh, what matters is you need to get people to play the game. It's a red flag? It's not a red flag. It's like a yellow flag. It's like, it, this is something that you should be aware of, but that's about it. Yeah, it was a dev stream, too. Uh, there's more uh, in the case linear games because we end up being told what to do otherwise. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that so many negative people holy. Well, I think that people are just like, whenever somebody brings out a game that's like the scale of Dune and that promises the amount of fantasy that Dune has, I think that it's fair to be very, very skeptical. And I don't think that anything... The only thing that I found to be moving... The, like, my excitement for this game went up slightly and the only reason why is because the guy that that she was interviewing this dude it seems like this guy actually like read all the books and it seems like he was kind of a pretty big fan of the series so like that was probably the only reason why my excitement for something like this would have gone up because it seems like okay this guy so what well he's going to make it in a way that is informed by the source material so, like, again, I mean, that's that doesn't make the game going to... It's not it's not like, oh, the game's going to be good now. Oh, my God, it's going to be good. No, but it increases the probability of success. That's all. It's that simple. Yeah, it, it, it seems like he's passionate about the idea and about the world. But isn't that his job? It is. But, like, if you compare it to, like, other people talking about other games, it's definitely different. Bro, memorize the book language. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, this is... It, that's that's okay all right maybe maybe we'll have something interesting here because yeah I, I think that like with a lot of especially with something that has like such an established world like it, it's important to have somebody who understands what that world is 
and really appreciates it. He may be passionate, but the CEO wants numbers and fast. Yeah, but I mean, you could say that with any company or any game. It'll be fun and that'll, that'll be all that matters. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it'll be fun or not. I mean, fuck. I, I really hope it will be, but who knows why? Uh, Dune is co-devved by Jaeger Development, the X-Cycle Frontier devs, and for this reason I boycott. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Thanks for being fair about every game. I try to be as fair as I can be. I really do. And, like, there are some really good, promising, cool things about this game. But also, like, again, this game just... This is a game that's going to thrive on its end game and its, like, social systems. So, like, how could I possibly make a, a judgment about this before I actually saw what the game is? Before I really played the game? And as far as I know, like, there's no real gameplay for this yet at all. We shall see see who's producing the game, not just directing. It won't live up to the scale, but the PvP will be awesome. You can destroy bases and blow them up. Yeah, that would be cool. Never judge a book by its cover. Power World looks trash, but it's really fun to play. That's true. Yeah.